Good morning. I'm Councilmember Idenick Miller, and I'm the chair of the Committee on Civil Service and Labor. And I'm happy to be joined by my colleague, Councilmember Mark Levine, the chair of the Committee on Health. I would like to thank everyone for coming out this morning's hearing. Today's joint oversight hearing will focus on the health of September 11th responders and the surrounding community. We will be receiving an update on the state of 9-11 survivors and its first responders' health. In addition, this important oversight, the Committee on Civil Service and Labor will be hearing a resolution introduced, int introduced by myself, Resolution 655, which will call upon the Mayor to grant sick leave to all civilian officers, employees, officers and employees of New York City seeing treatment for, seeking treatment for qualifying World Trade Center-related conditions. The terrorist, attack, uh, the terrorist attack of September 11, 2001 had a profound and lasting effect on New York City and the nation as a whole. One of these was the harmful health effects of those who were first responders and survivors of these attacks. Aside from the large number of direct deaths and acute injuries felt on that day, thousands have been left with chronic health issues ranging from asthma, cancer, mental health conditions. These health issues have had as adverse consequences on many people's daily lives, including continuing to work and finding future employment. Some of the city's workforce were entitled to unlimited sick leave, otherwise known as online, in the line of duty sick leave, because they were injured while on the, in the line of duty. Regrettably, this limited, was limited to the uniformed services, the fire department, police department, sanitation and corrections. However, other city employees such as EMT, engineers, peace officers, laborers, and others who participated in the recovery efforts and now suffer from World Trade Center related health conditions do not have the same benefits. Notably, after many years, this problem has been partially addressed by Mayor de Blasio announcing on October 23rd that an agreement had been reached with DC 37, the city's largest municipal labor union. The agreement stipulates that the city will provide unlimited 9-11 sick leave to an estimated 2,000 active city workers who participated in ground zero recovery and cleanup operations and contracted a World Trade Center related health condition. More importantly, this sick leave is retroactive to September 11, 2001 and leave taken since then will be restored. While we are glad that these workers will, will now be compensated for the treatment they sought for their illness. The time, the, city, the time is now for the city to do right by all members of its workforce who went above and beyond the call of duty and it is long past due. Though we anticipate the announcement of future agreements with other unions representing these brave workers, as each day passes, they will continue to use their regular sick leave miss work, retire prematurely, or simply just die waiting for a benefit. They should have received a long time ago as a matter of general principle and not collective bargaining. I'd like to thank uh, today's hearing. We will also uh, look at the issue of city workers being denied or delayed authorization of disability pensions due to their efforts in the, on the line of duty at Ground Zero. While this council has no direct legislative oversight over various city pension systems, we can certainly shine a light on this issue and advocate for the thousands of city workers who simply are willing to be treated fairly and with the dignity by the city and the leadership of the pension system for the city employees. I look forward to hearing from those who testify and understanding how these health and employment concerns are being addressed. I would like to acknowledge the council member I would like, and I would also like to thank my legislative and policy aide, Brandon Clark, senior policy analyst, uh, Joseph Goldblum, council uh, policy analyst, and fin finance analyst, uh, Malcolm, Kevin, and Kendall. With that, I'll now turn it over to, uh, to my co-chair for his opening statement. Thank you so, so much, co-chair Miller. I am excited about this topic. To our knowledge, it has been a long time 
since this council has focused on the critical issue of the health of those women and men who working for the city had their health irreparably impacted by proximity to Ground Zero. I'm excited that we are joined here today by our colleagues, Councilmember Danny Drum, Councilmember Adrian Adams, and Councilmember Alan Maisel. Today's hearing will look at various issues stemming from the terrorist attacks of 9-11, particularly at the continued health of survivors, first responders, and community members, and the challenges faced by those who continue to suffer from the effects of the 9-11 attacks. The effects of 9-11 have continued to manifest themselves in the brave first responders who rushed to the scene and in the people who lived in the neighborhoods surrounding Ground Zero. These effects have been both mental and physical, caused by traumatizing scenes and contaminants released in the air by collapsed buildings. Symptoms that have proven to be directly linked to the 9-11 attacks are known as qualifying World Trade Center related health conditions. The Department of Health and Mental Hygiene and the Federal Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry created the World Trade Center Registry, which is a data gathering effort that started in May 2009 to document the effects of ground zero on people working, living, and studying in the vicinity. The registry has since led to city-funded offshoots that focused on more specific groups, such as a study of lower Manhattan residents and office workers exposed to the disaster. Thanks to the World Trade Center Registry and in accordance with the World Trade Center Health Program, we now know what the top 10 certified World Trade Center conditions are and can track World Trade Center condition, conditions with more certainty and regularity. These conditions have been documented affecting uh, police officers, firefighters, emergency medical technicians, civilians living in the area, and even Stuyvesant High School students who were attending school when the attacks occurred. With this data, we must ensure that every New Yorker and person affected by 9-11 receives the care to which they are entitled. And those impacted by the worst terrorist attack in, in, in American history uh, must receive meaningful and effective care. In this hearing, we hope to find out about the state of health of New York City communities affected by, uh, by, by proximity to Ground Zero, and we aim to hear from people both previously and newly diagnosed with World Trade Center health conditions to gain a better understanding of how their lives have been affected and understand what resources were available to them and how all this has affected their quality of life. We also seek to learn from DOHMH what the city plans and continues to do to meet and address the needs of all our residents to make sure that no person or detail is neglected. The outstanding bravery and sacrifice exhibited by New Yorkers have made their mark on our nation. We must ensure that those efforts are met with the sufficient care and attention they deserve. It's customary at the end of opening statements to thank your committee staff, which I'm gonna do but I have to give them an extra, extra, extra special shout out because the health committee has staffed no fewer than nine hearings in the last five weeks. It's a remarkable, remarkable run. Um, I'm exhausted just thinking about it. So I do want to um, really thank and acknowledge our committee counsel, Zay Emanuel Halu, Sara Liss, policy analyst, Emily Balkin, finance analyst, Jeanette Merrill, and my legislative and policy team, Amy Slattery, Aya Keefe, and Jake Sporn, for making this hearing and the previous eight hearings possible. Thank you very much. And I think we're going to turn it over to the administration. Uh, yes? And we'll, we'll do the affirmation, please. Thank you. Can you please raise your right hand? Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yes. Yes. Please state your name and title and begin when you're ready. Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you, Chair Miller, Chair Levine, and members of the council here today for holding this important hearing to discuss the health of 9-11 responders in the surrounding community. My name is Stephen Banks, General Counsel of the New York City Office of Labor, Labor Relations. 
Uh, the primary purpose of my testimony will be to describe and lay out recent progress the city has made with its municipal unions regarding sick leave benefits for civilian employees who responded on and after 9-11-2001. Uh, but before I get into the substance of those recently negotiated agreements, and on behalf of Commissioner Lynn, I would like to take this opportunity to note the profound gratitude and respect that the Office of Labor Relations as an institution has for all city employees, um, but particularly those who responded to the catastrophic attacks of September 11th. Um, it's sometimes taken for granted that our, that our municipal employees answer the call to rescue their fellow citizens and perform all the necessary functions to keep the city moving and thriving. During and after the 9-11 attacks, all types of city employees did so with honor, pride, and courage. Um, the issue, uh, less than two months ago in late October, we were able to reach a settlement with DC 37 to provide a brand new 9-11 sick leave benefit and thereby resolve an issue that had been concerning for many of those who responded and helped the city get back on its feet after 9-11. Uh, the issue had been that while the city's uniform services of police, fire, correction, and sanitation receive uh, unlimited sick leave, most civilian employees accrue a set number of days, usually one per month or 12 per year. Uh, most civilian employees also accrue up to 27 annual leave days, which are used for vacation and other personal business. Um, it was brought to our attention that there were and are civilian employees who participated in the rescue, recovery, and cleanup operations related to 9-11. Uh, and later developed illnesses which did not require retirement but affected employees' ability to continue working. Uh, the reason I mention retirement is that there have been amendments to the pension law which affected these same employees. Uh, in 2005, the landmark, landmark World Trade Center presumption law was passed and has been expanded through amendments thereafter. Uh, this groundbreaking law provides a presumption in the New York State Retirement and Social Security law that certain enumerated illnesses were contracted as a result of the participation in the World Trade Center rescue, recovery, and cleanup. Those deemed to have participated according to eligibility criteria in the law may qualify for accident disability benefits and in the event of death, their survivors may also qualify for an accidental death benefit. Now the issue of a separate sick leave benefit for 9-11 responders as a supplement to the existing benefits in place uh, first came to my attention last spring based on a bill that was proposed in Albany to provide a new benefit. Um, we thought that the appropriate forum to address uh, the issues of these workers was at the collective bargaining table. Paid leave benefits are generally considered a mandatory subject of collective bargaining, and provisions regarding various types of paid leave are in all of our collective bargaining agreements with the city. Um, in general, we at OLR do firmly believe that collective bargaining negotiation is the best way uh, to solve these sorts of issues because it allows for all sides to be heard and for all interests to be balanced. Uh, from a labor relations standpoint, uh, we in New York City want to be the answer to Wisconsin, and we want to show that collective bargaining does in fact work for both the employees and the taxpayers. Uh, we believe we've demonstrated this in a number of ways, including with other paid leave issues. Earlier this year, Commissioner Lynn testified next door regarding paid parental leave for teachers at the DOE, and a couple of months later, we announced an agreement with the UFT providing a new paid parental leave benefit. Um, in this case, uh, with regard to 9-11 sick leave, the city, uh, led by Sharif Solomon, who's here with me today, engaged with DC 37 and worked out a mutually, benefit, mutually beneficial agreement. Uh, the key terms are uh, unlimited sick leave for any civilian employees who participated in the World Trade Center rescue, recovery, and cleanup operations and has contracted a qualifying World Trade Center condition, which renders them unable to work. Now, both of these terms, rescue, recovery, and cleanup, and qualifying World Trade Center condition are terms of arts, which, have, which until now have been used for the eligibility for the pension benefits that I described earlier. And so we tracked those same criteria for the sick leave benefit. Um, employees receiving this benefit will be subject to medical monitoring, not unlike our uniformed employees who report to the med medical division at their respective agency while they're out on unlimited sick leave. Um, and for employees who are currently active and have therefore not been able to benefit from the pension amendment described earlier, sick leave will be restored retroactively, as the chair mentioned, for absences in the past that were connected to the World Trade Center condition. Um, now, since the agreement was reached with DC 37 in October, we've approached every other civilian union and offered that they sign on under the same terms. Uh, this is necessary because each employee organization has a legal right to negotiate the benefits for their members. To date, nine other unions after DC 37 have signed on, and we expect others to follow suit in the coming weeks and months. Uh, we're also working on implementation issues 
Uh, we have a meeting with DC 37 tomorrow to discuss some of the rollout uh, and the standing up of this new benefit. Uh, we are extremely proud to have partnered with our unions to solve an important issue for those who served us in the face of unspeakable tragedy. I'd like to recognize the leadership of the mayor and the first deputy mayor in allowing this to move forward. And I'll be happy to answer any questions about the labor negotiations and the new 9-11 sick benefit. Um, and if there are questions about the registry, uh, we have folks from uh, the Department of Health and Health and Hospitals to uh, assist in answering those questions as well. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Banks. If I could just ask, uh, we have uh, Mr. Farfell from, from DOH. Would you mind joining the panel just so that we can ask you questions as well as they come up? And uh, we'll, we'll ask our committee counsel to do the affirmation for you. Thank you. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Okay, uh, Mr. Solomon does not have uh, testimony. So um, let me just say, first say that we've been joined by council members uh, Mizell, Eugene, and Adams. And everybody's here. So with that being said, uh, let's start off with uh, Mr. Banks's testimony where he uh, described uh, briefly the agreement with DC 37. Now, and uh, so now that the agreement has been reached with DC 37 to provide their members with unlimited SIP, how, how many other unions would you say, I think it was 11, uh, that you have reached out to better understand this universe? Uh, we are talking about how many uh, non-uniform uh, employees, including DC 37, did not have access to line of duty uh, unlimited sick leave or how many DC 37 employees will be covered in this new agreement? So in terms of your question about the number of civilian employees, there's just under 300,000 civilian city employees currently, almost 100,000 in DC 37. Um, most of those have come on into city employment well after 2001, 2002. So in terms of the number affected, it's gonna be a, a, a small subset of that population who actually were not active city employees in 9-11 in, in the year after and participated in the rescue recovery and cleanup. Um, and then I think I mentioned during my testimony that uh, since DC 37, uh, we reached the agreement in October, nine other unions have signed on in the couple of months since then. Could you identify those other local unions? Sure, uh, Teamsters Local 237, uh, Local 246 Auto Mechanics, Fire Alarm Dispatchers, uh, the District Council of Carpenters, uh, the Probation Officers Association, uh, Operating Engineers Local 15, uh, Local 300, uh, Local 1199, and the uh, the Atlantic Maritime Group. And and the, uh, the the language in this provision is consistent with that of DC 37. Yeah, our goal was to um, come up with a, a, a consistent civilian benefit that would apply to um, to any civilian employee. And what is the estimated time frame uh, to reach the agreement with the necessary unions to provide unlimited sick leave to city employees uh, with the 12 uh, World Trade Center uh, related injuries that, that we, um, what's the time frame that we, that we're able to capture that entire universe? Yeah, so, I mean, that's not completely within our control, right? It, it's a, a bilateral conversation, but we've reached out to all of those unions. Some have come back with very legitimate questions about how the process works. In the example of DC 37, we had a long back and forth of negotiations. So uh, some of our other union partners have to um, uh, get up to speed, but they've been sort of rolling in on a, on a weekly basis. So I, it's our expectation that most, if not all, will be wrapped up in the coming weeks. So um, you say that you've reached out to all the, all the bargaining units represented uh, by the city of New York. How, how have you, uh, well, so what was the outreach? Did you just send out a general memorandum that, that of those who may have been impacted by 9-11 related illnesses should, should be spawned, that there's a, a renewal of the registry and, and potentially uh, uh, collective bargaining opportunity over unlimited sick time? 
or had was there some form of a database that I had identified those who had served during recovery uh, in 2001 and beyond? It, we found from anecdotal information that uh, it's likely that all, or if not all, then almost all of our city unions will have been touched, even with just a, a few employees who participated. So our, our goal was to just reach out to all of the, the civilian unions. And so our office, uh, you know, through myself and some of the other negotiators at OLR, reached out to each union individually, um, explained what had happened with the DC 37 agreement, and um, uh, suggested that a, a similar provision uh, be extended to their members. Uh, and, and that would kind of include folks like traffic enforcement that were down and, and, and had their response. I know that over the past five years that I've done hundreds of uh, general membership meetings with, with, with local unions, and, and this has been a, a topic of conversation. and. And, and uh, I just wanted to make sure that those who I've spoken to over the past five years had been included with this and, 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 and then um, perhaps uh, without getting into detail, detail, just the, the overtone of the framework, what that looks like. Because I know I was uh, uh, many, many years ago when, when the uh, original language was drafted uh, um, for the uni uniform. Uh, agencies that uh, it was very specific to the work that they were doing and um, that just want to be sure that the same opportunity exists and that uh, the proper outreach was being done that we captured the entire universe of folks that had been impacted. So uh, just again, um, could you elaborate on how that was done? It, 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 as well as, as well as, we we are now we have now established that folks are are suffering not just physical but mental and emotional uh, uh, related issues um, as well. And how have we then addressed that and and um, incorporated that into the language that that we've uh, been using for the past decade? Yeah, I mean, so certainly our goal would be to cover any civilian city employees, so that would include traffic enforcement agents, like you mentioned. We had school safety agents who were working in the schools, like Chair Levine mentioned, you know, uh, who were uh, potentially impacted as well. I mentioned the auto mechanics, if you just think of, you know, they were fixing the vehicles that had been down at the Ground Zero site. Um, and, you know, uh, folks in our 911 system, I mentioned the fire alarm dispatchers. And, you know, my understanding, I'm, I'm not an expert in this area, but my understanding is that the existing pension law qualifying conditions does include a range of mental health issues um, as part of the qualifying conditions. So, you know, we believe that um, the structure that we've established does cover those sorts of issues for the people who need it. And, and, and do you believe that the, the, the language that was used to provide this benefit to the DC 37 members and subsequently the other members gives you the type of latitude uh, that is necessary uh, to serve those members moving forward. That sometimes that the uh, um, the previous language may have been restrictive in what we see um, so far as addressing mental health and other issues and particular concerns of this workforce. Does this give you the latitude? Do you have the latitude within the framework of this language? To, to be able to move forward in serving those uh, employees and allowing them to have the benefits that they need? So speaking from a collective bargaining perspective, we thought that the existing uh, pension law did provide a good framework for defining not only the service in, t in terms of rescue, recovery, and cleanup, but it, uh, the qualifying conditions, the bill that was pending in Albany used some of those structures as well. So uh, we, we did think that that appropriately covered our employees and that's ultimately was um, the, the structure that we agreed to with our union, so there obviously there was some some bilateral agreement that that that, that structure made sense. Um, so if we need to look at something in the future. The good thing about collective bargaining, right, is we can always come back to the table if something needs to be addressed. Um, uh, you know, if if there is uh, something that the parties hadn't anticipated, you could always come back to the table. Okay, good. Um, I'm gonna, with that, I'm going to pass it over to uh, Council Member Levine. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I just want to emphasize the extent to which 
This hearing is focused on a group of victims of the worst terrorist attack in American history who, for too long, were being ignored. The public generally only thinks about the people who perished the day of the attack and secondarily of the heroic first responders who um, absolutely deserve every bit of support from this city and this society for their sacrifice. But there was another group of victims, which is people who reported to work out of duty to their city and ended up spending days, weeks, months breathing in air, which we now understand was toxic. And uh, we owe it to them to ensure that they have every accommodation to get the care they need to avoid financial hardship. And uh, that's what this hearing is about. And we are um, pleased that you've achieved a landmark agreement now with DC 37 and that this is now being followed by other unions. Uh, I, I just want to follow up, if I can, as much as I can clarify the excellent questions of my colleague. Um, how soon can we expect that every city employee who was exposed will be covered by this uh, new policy? So again, that's not completely within our control. That's a bilateral discussion between us and each, each union. Um, but based on the feedback that we've received so far, obviously it's a new benefit on top. We're, you know, we're not asking for any uh, givebacks or trade-offs, right? Uh, we and, 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 and sorry to interrupt, because that point is so, so, so key. If, usually in collective bargaining, one side gives something and the other side gives something. And I don't think it would be fair if workers who didn't ask to be sent to work near ground zero now are told they have to give something up to receive uh, the benefit of paid sick time. So can you just clarify the extent to which um, we can avoid that w unfair uh, arrangement? Yes, please, Mr. Sullivan. Sure, uh, Chair Levine. Um, so from the outset, when we started discussions with the unions on this benefit, our intention was to keep the discussion solely on the issue of extending sick leave benefits to affected employees. In no way did we intend, nor did we ask or engage in conversations about trade-offs or any sort of compromises outside of this issue for any other labor issue. Our intent from the very beginning, and it is today, to make sure that we have a program that works, that meets the balance of both labor and on the city side. So. Uh, it, this is not intended to make sure we have any um, compromises outside of this actual benefit. That's such an important point, and I appreciate you clarifying that. Um, for, for the Department of Health, um, so the, 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 the registry, uh, can you update us on the number of people who are currently participating? Sure. Um, the registry was established in 2003-2004 when 71,000 people voluntarily enrolled in the registry to help us understand long-term 9-11 health impacts. So we have worked very hard over the years. We've had repeated health surveys to get health updates from our enrollees. And we um, give our enrollees many, many ways to stay in touch with us, give us their updated contact information so that we can continue to communicate with them about their health. So we, we've had really great participation in our surveys and um, you know we still try to include all 71,000 in the various research projects that we do. And um, you know we've had quite a bit of success over the years in documenting the long-term health impacts of 9-11. Do you also track whether these individuals have health insurance and do you have a sense of how many lack health insurance? Uh, no, I, I don't have that information on the top of my head. What we uh, do put emphasis on is referring our enrollees to the World Trade Center Health Program. So we, we make many efforts to, to inform everybody in the registry of the existence of the World Trade Center Health Program. And then more importantly, for those individuals in the registry who tell us that they have 9-11 related symptoms and conditions on our health surveys, we reach out to them personally 
and we encourage them to apply for the program and we offer them an application and assistance. And so over time, uh, we've reached out to more than 20,000 people just since 2013. And we know that 7,000 of our enrollees so far have made an application to the World Trade Center Health Program. So it's an ongoing process. It's a, it's a core part of what we do as a registry because as you know, we don't provide care. It's not our mission. The World Trade Center Health Program does that. But a very important aspect of our work is a devoted unit that tries to reach out and encourage people to apply. Do you track uh, qualifying medical conditions that these individuals uh, might have, have contracted? No, we're basically, we learn about health through the self-report, but the World Trade Center Health Program for privacy, HIPAA reasons, does not inform us of that type of information. What about fatalities? We, we do, uh, we do ga engage in studies to, to monitor mortality among the World Trade Center Health so Registry how, enrollees. How many, people, how many people have died due to injuries sustained in this attack? Um, I, I don't have the information on the number of deaths in my head, but the core focus of the, the research on mortality is the question of whether, whether you see mortality happening at a rate higher than comparable or general populations. And we're generally not, not seeing that yet uh, in these studies, but they will be ongoing. So, so can you estimate how many people have died due to sicknesses contracted? Are we talking hundreds, thousands? No, I, I'm not able to give an estimate because as, as I said, the, you know, the research to date does not show an overall increase uh, in mortality, so I, I don't have those numbers. Uh, do, does the federal program have those numbers? Um, I, I'm, I'm not sure. But there certainly are gonna be cases where people have a severe lung disease that can be quite clearly attributed to breathing toxic air. Uh, this is not only about statistical estimation. Now, there, there, there are no individual cases we can point to where the cause of the mortality was clear? I, I think I would just uh, bounce that question over to our health program colleagues who are actually see, seeing the patients in clinic um, and, and dealing with these types of conditions that you just mentioned. You know, it's commonly said that that about 3,000 people died in the attack of 9-11. Uh, that number clearly underestimates the toll. And it's, it's upsetting to me that we don't actually know how many other lives were lost in the aftermath. Uh, I think we need to ascertain that number uh, for the good of the, the individuals and families and, and uh, for the benefit of history. Uh, so we, we, we would like to continue to explore that question with you. Um, <coughs> right. Um, mental health services are available to those who are suffering from the emotional after effects, is that correct? And are you making referrals for such purposes? Yes, uh, when I mentioned the registry's treatment referral program, the, the way it works is that if our enrollees are reporting 9-11 related mental or physical health conditions, uh, then we do include them in our outreach, most definitely. Okay. There were children in school near Ground Zero uh, as soon as several weeks after the attack, uh, Stuyvesant High School being a block away, um, it, it's frightening to think about uh, the possible impacts on young lungs of breathing that air. Can you state anything uh, specific to children who were exposed? Yes. Um the World Trade Center Health Registry, uh, through their parents, we uh, had enrolled about 3,200 people who were children at the time of 9-11. And uh, in the mix of all of the various studies that the registry has done, we have taken a look at respiratory and mental health impacts on children as well as behavioral impacts. And we have a number of publications in that area that we could share with you. Uh, but we do, we do in the broad the broad range of research we do, we have a number of studies that have focused on children, and earlier in the introduction, 
um, it was mentioned the um, various respiratory studies uh, that were done, and um, we've looked at studies of adolescents and how their physical and mental health um, has progressed over time. Um, and we have also collaborated with external researchers who have recruited our registry enrollees into more in-depth studies of children's emotional and mental health, for example, studies at Columbia University or NYU. So we, we, we not only do research ourselves in-house, but we provide a platform for qualified expert external academic type researchers to do even more in-depth studies. So, so DOHMH has a very sophisticated system for communicating to hospitals, doctors, physicians, medical providers about uh, emerging trends uh, that you see in public health. Do you have a system in place to communicate to medical providers with trends you're seeing among health conditions amongst Yes, I, I, can, I can mention several avenues that we, we've tried to do that. Uh, one is that the, the health department collaborated with the Clinical Centers of Excellence over time on producing physician guidelines for, for doctors who are caring for uh, both survivors and responders. Uh, those guidelines were, were updated, and there's also a set of guidelines focused on uh, physicians taking care of children. So that's one avenue. The other is the we have the 9-11 Health Information website, um, and on that website, the registry makes all of its research findings available. We have information on the website on the 9-11 uh, uh, Health Program there. Uh, we, we have summaries of the health impacts of 9-11, so we have a lot of useful information, and that's updated uh, periodically, and then we communicate routinely with our enrollees with annual reports, and we include all of those resources as well as the research findings. Okay, thank you. I want to pass it off to, to my co-chair who has additional questions. I just want to make the, the, the important final point that uh, we've really had a two-tiered system now for uh, people who, because of their job working for the city, were exposed to the dangers of Ground Zero, and we have thankfully and rightly given a very robust um, set of benefits to the first responders, but for the broader uh, number of municipal workers who were classifying survivors, um, where there's been too many obstacles in place. And we know that there are people who have had to lose their jobs because they needed to take sick time, and um, we know that that has put them in some cases into bankruptcy. We know that people who are no longer working are probably um, more likely to see their health deteriorate because of all the benefits that remaining in the workforce would provide. So uh, we want to continue to push to make sure that every worker here um, in, who was doing their job for the city, uh, every resident of the neighborhood, every student in every school nearby um, gets the support they need uh, for their medical care, for their financial benefits, uh, to make sure that uh, the city never forgets uh, the sacrifice they made uh, on the most difficult day in American history. Uh, I'm going to pass it back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Chair Levine. So um, to follow up on what, what Chair Levine just mentioned in terms of those who have been separated from, from the city's employment, uh, what is the outreach on those who have retired or been forced to retire or just for some way separated service, how, how have we outreached and what is the relationship um, and have you collaborated with the MLC and the other bargaining units to be able to identify those individuals? So thank you, Chair Miller. Um, so just speaking broadly, I think what we what we have achieved here with these agreements um, filled a gap that existed, right? What we view, how we view this is sort of providing a continuum of care. We had the pension piece that was set in law since 2005 that, that covered people who were disabled because of 9-11 work. And then upon their death, their survivors could qualify for an accidental death benefit. The gap was for people who were still employed by the city and who wanted to stay working for the city. 
And so I think with these agreements, we have started to fill that gap, fill that void. And so we have people who currently are on payroll, which you know, essentially make up the lion's share of, uh, of the eligible population. Um, we certainly have people who have separated from service since then, and we have people who are still um, employed by the city, not uh, on active payroll, but are on some kind of leave. So, so it is the people who have separated from city service who are not on leave and who have not retired that I think we want to have a robust dialogue with the unions about how to reach out to those individuals to make sure that are they able to come back to work, first of all, or are they awaiting, for example, a retirement benefit and to see if there is anything that could be done for, for that group of employees. But I think for the most part, we have employees who are, are on active payroll, who, who are on some kind of leave, or who have since retired pursuant to the disability laws that are uh, on the books. So that, this, that does shed real light on, on where we're trying to get with this, because obviously we want to capture as much of the universe as possible, and we know that um, those individuals are certainly out there. Um, based on the registry, now I know in, in my situation in my years in, in 2001 in the, uh, with the MTA and, and, and members that I once represented, including myself, uh, that were down there that, that uh, signed on to the registry, that registry is, is no longer available, but we do know that for those to sign up now, considering that these um, uh, conditions manifest themselves over time that people are coming in. So number one, I, I wanna kind of fall back and be able to talk about the registry, how folks that, that come in and, and, and use um, uh, the services of uh, Department of Health and Mental Health, um, and kind of identify these these illnesses as 9/11 related. What then? How how are they treated? And how do we move forward with that? Um, if they were not previously on on a part of the registry, um, certainly we want to speak to that. But again, and how do we? Um, uh, how are we identifying uh, those individuals who are separated from service? I'm glad that there's outreach with, with the unions in, um, in, in doing so. But for those who, what are we relying on um, for those who are separated from service and even those who are, are working who are not upon a part of the registry, how are we identifying and, and serving those individuals? Sure. Um so it's important to note that for not only the pension laws, but also for this 9-11 sick leave benefit, um, the gateway to the benefit is that you are pre-qualified um, um, uh, under the pension law. Uh, and the ability to file what's called a notice of participation, which allows you to be pre-qualified by the pension systems, the, the deadline has been extended numerous times by the state legislature, and you can file a notice at any time before September 11th of 2022. So the opportunity still exists for employees who uh, have participated in rescue recovery and cleanup operations to file with the retirement systems a notice of participation. So that opportunity then is still exists for them to access the 9-11 sick leave benefit. So that has not been foreclosed. Okay, that is great, and um, I just want to make sure that all the bargaining unit representing these employees are, are aware of this information. What happens to those employees that are non-represented, the managerial staff and others? Do they have an opportunity to take advantage of, of, of uh, this new round of bargaining as well? Absolutely. So, um, as we do in other cases, um, we will uh, we will be. Um, we will be doing a mayoral personnel order to cover managers and the, for the non-represented employees um, so that they're covered. So that, that is pretty thorough. Uh, as I just kind of scanned the room, I noticed as well as when we talked about the, um, when the chair mentioned that it's Stuyvesant High School and, and those students and uh, I did not, as you talked about those uh, bargaining units that 
those 11 bargaining units I did not hear UFT, certainly that conversation is ongoing as well. Yeah, we, right. we've reached out to them. We're in conversations. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, okay. Thank you so much for your testimony. Oh, uh -uh, we by Council Member Powers. Thank you, and it's and it's actually not a question. question. Thank you, I appreciate it. I, it's not a question. I just wanted to say, first of all, thank you to the folks here for your efforts to, uh, uh, two months ago, I guess, with DC 37 to help bring more folks into it. But I also, I would really want to thank you, the chairs, for having this hearing because we always say never forget, but oftentimes we, we actually do forget to uh, help those who helped us in our most critical moment in this city. I think everybody has a story about where they were on 9-11 when they found out the news. In some cases, people, there was, there was an election day, if you remember, and folks were uh, out there actually doing their demo democratic uh, duty as this happens. So um, I just want to say thank you to the chairs for keeping this conversation uh, moving forward so that no, anybody who worked at or around the site um, on, at Ground Zero is not left out of an important critical service they have. So I have no questions, but I just want to say thank you for the collective effort here to make sure those folks are continuously taken care of and remembered. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Council Member Powers. Again, um, I just want to echo that as well. Thank you for the efforts and uh, uh, having represented those workers on each side and been a part of the early negotiations, even with the original uh, uh, package representing uniform workers. Uh, it is so important that we not forget and that we understand unintended consequences and that that this is something that has evolved and that we want to be able to, to ensure that we capture that not just the universal folks that, that were involved in, but that next gen that potentially are involved, that we keep this dialogue open. And, and certainly um, the administration is to be applauded uh, for providing this benefit uh, that had for so long been missing. And as was mentioned, created two tiers of, of benefits for those who have served. And so bringing equities is always important and uh, really keeping the light on those who, who so violently served and no matter what capacity is, is very important. And I, I thank you for, for your testimony. And uh, this is open-ended just as it is with those uh, bargaining units involved. It is certainly with the council. I ask that whatever happens as we move forward that you continue to keep the council informed and, and because we are certainly a partner as we move forward. So thank you so much for your testimony. Thanks. Thank you. Our next panel is Karen Mazza, Elise Sislat from NYSA, and Nicole from the Police Pension Fund. From the police pension fund. <laughs> Uh, for those who had recently joined us, if you were looking to uh, testify, please fill out a witness slip. We've been joined by Council Member Amphrey Samuels. Okay. Could you please state your name for the record and begin your testimony? Good morning. I'm Karen Mazza. Thank you for this opportunity to appear before you here today. I'm the Deputy Executive Director of New York City Employees Retirement System, and with me here today is Elise Sisolak, our General Counsel. <laughs> Our executive director, Melanie Winery, sends her regards and her regrets that she could not be here today as she is traveling back from a previously planned visit with her mother. For background, as you may know, NICERS is one of the city's five defined benefit plans 
It is the largest municipal pension system in the country and provides benefits to a diverse population of city employees from sanitation workers and correction officers to city council members and the mayor. NYSERS provides disability benefits to its members under several provisions of law. But in light of today's agenda, I will focus on the laws related to the World Trade Center. The World Trade Center disability law provides in part that certain disabling injuries, illnesses, or diseases incurred by certain state and city employees, including NYSERS members, who participated in res World Trade Center rescue, recovery, or cleanup operations are presumed to have been incurred as a result of an accident sustained in the performance and discharge of duty. For any member to qualify for a disability retirement under the World Trade Center law, the member must file a notice of participation and be verified as having participated in WTC rescue, recovery, and cleanup operations that meet certain criteria. The member's notice of participation is filed with NICERS and then provided to the agency where the member worked during the qualifying period. The agency is asked to verify, to either verify the member's participation or state why the agency could not verify that the member participated. If an agency cannot verify participation, the member is given an opportunity to dispute the agency's findings by submitting additional evidence to support the claim. If the agency still cannot verify after reviewing the additional evidence, the member's case is reviewed by NYSER's Board of Trustees World Trade Center Review Committee. A verified notification is a placeholder in the event that the member becomes subsequently ill. If the member becomes ill and applies for World Trade Center disability retirement, they submit medical evidence in support of their claim, and the case is brought before the NYSERS Medical Board. The Medical Board is an independent board of three physicians appointed pursuant to the New York City Administrative Code. The Medical Board must determine whether the member is suffering from a World Trade Center qualifying condition or impairment as defined by law. To make this determination, the Medical Board reviews all medical evidence and conducts an interview and physical examination of the member. By law, the Medical Board's determination regarding disability is binding on the Board of Trustees. If the Medical Board determines that the member is disabled by a World Trade Center qualifying condition, then the Medical Board is required to presume the condition is a result of the member's participation in rescue, recovery, and cleanup. However, the presumption can be rebutted if the Medical Board finds that documentation, interview, and examination support a finding that the presumption is rebutted. In that case, the Medical Board makes a recommendation to the Board of Trustees that the World Trade Center presumption is rebutted. The member may appeal the Medical Board's re recommendation to the Board of Trustees. After such appeal, the, medical, the Board of Trustees makes a final determination regarding whether the member qualifies for disability under World Trade Center law. That's the World Trade Center law, I'm sorry, that's the World Trade Center disability process at a very high level. There are many more detailed steps in the process and every member's case and circumstances are different. I encourage you to visit the World Trade Center section of our website. It contains information helpful to members, such as information on the law, forms, frequently asked questions, and links to other organizations, such as the World Trade Center Health Program, the 9-11 Victims Compensation Fund, Workers' Compensation, and more. There are also two reports from our executive director that highlight the improvements that NYSERS and our Board of Trustees have made in the World Trade Center and disability process. The entire NYSERS team is committed to working with our stakeholders, the Medical Board, and the Board of Trustees to continue to make changes that would help our members who serve New York City during a terrible tragedy to receive all benefits they are entitled to expeditiously and compassionately. Thank you. Okay. Um. We are glad to see that this information is readily available on the NYSER uh, website and for those members to access in advance of uh, applying for disability retirement and what is necessary and what are qualifying conditions, certainly. Uh, but could you? I know that uh, in reviewing testimony from, from uh, past hearings that NYSA were involved with, with other pension systems, that there is a 
distinct discrepancy in those who would qualify for disability pensions, particularly those uh, EMTs and others that did not uh, have a uh, specific agency pension, that NYSA was a little more stringent. Uh, are they, are, are your uh, qualifying qualifications and requirements for uh, disability pensions different from police or fire pensions? The law that covers both um, NICERS and police pension funds are, are the same. They're in different par parts of the law. But as far as qualifying conditions and participation in rescue, recovery, and cleanup, the definitions are the same. So how do you explain the uh, discrepancy in the numbers of those who have been approved um, by NICER as opposed to those is nearly a 25% difference? The only thing I could say is that the medical board is an independent board. They make the determination on disability, um, and their determination on disability is binding by law on the Board of Trustees. And these independent medical examiners, they are experts in uh, World Trade Center conditions? I would say that we have made an effort um, since this, these issues have come to our attention to get them from more familiar with the conditions related to World Trade Center. We've had meetings with um, the World Trade Center Health Fund doctors, um, and we've brought different different um, different types of doctors onto the board to provide that kind of coverage. And those employees who have come before the uh, those who applied and been denied, they have been um, given an opportunity, obviously under an appeal. Uh, but they have been uh, is the appeal with the same doctors or? the doctors that you were brought in with the uh, more extensive World Trade related experience, or are they the ones now making a determination? If a member's been denied, it depends on their status at the time that they're denied. For example, if someone is a pensioner, has already retired, they would apply to be reclassified, and they probably would see a different board than they saw initially. Um, the same goes for a member who is um, it's still in city service who reapplies. They probably would be seeing a different board. And so, did you just add uh, the, uh, a number of additional independent medical examiners? Uh, did you increase that number, or did you replace them, the ones that were previously there that may or not had the specific qualifications that are necessary to make a, 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 a adequate judgment about retirement? Where we, where we had um, openings on the boards, we filled them. Um, however, the number of doctors that were allowed to appoint from the three, the three appointing facilities is set in the administrative code, and we are hoping that we will get some legislation this year to allow us to expand the number of doctors that we can have on each, in each, in each um, Department of Health, uh, DCAS, and NICERS appointees to allow us to have more medical boards and to have more doctors with different uh, backgrounds. So again, how did, so how would you, how would you describe the discrepancies uh, between those approvals or lack thereof between the uh, pension boards? I really can't describe the, why there's discrepancies. The medical boards at the police department and the fire department are different boards than at NICERS. And as I said, it's, it's an independent board that makes the determination. Um, Council, um, Council Member Levine, I'm sorry. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you all for being here. Um, can you give us the number of World Trade Center related disability claims that you've received to date? The number of people who have filed for disability, um, 551 active members and 637 pensioners have applied up to, this, up to November 30th of this year. And so that represents the numbers that you have accepted. Have you correct? Have you denied? Is there a larger number of claims that you have denied? Um, the, on the approval side, there's been 137 active members approved and two, 226 pensioners, 
Denials have been 201 active and 244 pensioners. So it seems like you're denying about two-thirds of the claims. Yes. I'm not a mathematician, so I can't do it in my head that quickly. But it's not that we are denying them. It's the medical board is denying them. Or it may be that they are not, um, they're either found not disabled or they may be found to have not participated in rescue, recovery, and cleanup. Okay, but, but am I correct on the, on, on the estimation that over half have been denied? Yes. Now, just about half. Ele there's about 1,188 that have been applied, and 445 have been denied. Okay, so just under half. Mm -hmm. How many of those denials have been reversed on repeal on upon re appeal? I don't have that information available, but we'll certainly provide it to the council. Can I and just? Can I just ask for clarification on what you mean by appeal? Because there's different ways. I mean, there's appeal before the Board of Trustees, there's appeal before the Medical Board, and there's also an Article 78, which would be in the Supreme Court. So I just want to make sure we get you the right numbers. So if you could clarify what you'd like. Well, it would be great to get each of those categories. Do you have those numbers handy? Not handy Not right here, now. We can, can get them. OK, well, we, we, would, we would certainly like to get them. Um, and. and For those who have been denied, because this is so sensitive, uh, is is there any referral work that you that you do to help the the pensioner or the claimant uh, uh, restore to full health and overcome whatever challenges they are currently living with? I'm not. I don't understand what you're asking. If if someone is denied, is there anything the city can do for them to support them, short of approval of their claim? not from the pension system side. Okay. Council Member Adams. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning and thank you so much for your testimony here today. Just taking a look at the resources that are available, uh, you noted in your testimony that there is helpful information on your website, including FAQs, forms, and links to other organizations, which is great. Uh, your website also has an extensive executive director update that outlines a numerous set of changes at NICERS to facilitate more claims processed um, and enhance the customer service experience for those individuals that are filing the claims. Can you share some of the operational changes that have been made and how you plan to build on those successes? Yes, thank you. Um, the first thing that we did was we created two additional World Trade Center review committees, the Board of Trustees review committees, which is able to review 21 cases on appeal um, each day. Those are cases where the agencies cannot verify that the member participated in rescue, recovery, and cleanup. They then come before a um, committee of three of the Board of Trustees members. Um, by adding two additional boards, we only had one board, by adding two additional boards, we're able to see more cases every month. We've also um, allowed now for a simultaneous filing where a member can apply for both can apply for accident disability under World Trade Center, ordinary disability, and service, and whichever one is completed first, they are retired under, so they can continue to collect some form of pension and continue their health insurance. And then once the accidental disability claim is completed, they can either switch over to accidental, or if they need to appeal, they can do that. Um, Members can also, this is one of our biggest accomplishments, I think, now members can actually go online onto our website and review their notice of participation and the process that's going on with that, whether they've been verified or not verified and where they are in the process. Um, we also added two additional staff to the medical division um, staffing, and these people provide intensive World Trade Center um, work so members who are filing for disability or who have already filed for disability under World Trade Center, we have two dedicated staffers to deal with them to provide follow-up um, and to make sure they get scheduled um, timely. Um, and also, we um, under the reclassification process, which is where you've been retired already and you come back because you developed a World Trade Center illness, um, initially 
if you were retired under World Trade Center for any illness, we did not allow you to come back and, and reclassify. However, we found that that was limiting um, pensioners' ability to file for other benefits. So for example, if you were disabled um, for World Trade Center under psychological disability, you can now reclassify if you become ill with another, with another World Trade Center qualifying condition. That's a lot, thank you. Um, I just had one follow-up along those lines. Uh, Co-Chair Levine asked about numbers a little while ago, and according to your July 17, 2018 Executive Director update, the number of notices of participation had dramatically increased, uh, I'm sorry, decreased from 977 at the end of 2017 to 394. Do you know what that number is as of today? I have to report that that number actually went up, and the reason it went up was because, as Mr. Solomon testified, the law allowing people to file notices of participation was extended, so we did see a jump in people filing the notice of participation. So, so at the end of November, the number was up to 582, but many of those are as a result of the extension of the filing period. Okay, terrific. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Council Member Adams. Uh, can I get back to uh, explanation of uh, required participation? Now, is that onus responsibility on the member applying, and why would not the agency be able to provide that information? As we get further and further away from 2001, we're finding that, um, for example, during Superstorm Sandy, several agencies had um, things fi um, stored in basements that got flooded, so records of, of um, participation were, were lost in that. Um, as administrations change and, and staffing changes, people don't know people who had originally worked there, which is why we created the World Trade Center Committees, which allows a member to come in with any information they have and also to provide testimony to say, when they were there, what, what they were doing. Um, many times people were bringing things like badges from down at the World Trade Center site, um, affidavits from other um, employees who were there with them, and they bring it to the, the um, committee, which is, like I said, three members of the Board of Trustees to review. So, um, how, many, how many folks who were denied uh, appealed based on this new information or new opportunity? And how many folks were denied based on participation or lack of proof of participation? So we have, let me start with, we have a total, we've received a total of 11,103 notices of participation. Um, we have sent them all to the agencies to verify. We've received back 10,551 verifications. 552 are waiting agency reports. Of the, of those, of the total, 3,513 were not qualified. 7,038 were qualified. The 3,513 are then offered the opportunity to um, send in additional evidence to support their claim that they participated. Again, if the agency cannot verify on the second round, it goes to the World Trade Center Review Committee. And to further help the members, what happens is that if ultimately the Board of Trustees were to find that there wasn't enough evidence based on the subcommittee's review, it's not a final determination. So if at any time a member can get more affidavits, can get more documents and wants to resubmit it, those documents will go before the agency first because it is the agency's responsibility to verify. But if the agency still can't verify, we'll go then again go before the subcommittee for another review. It's not until the member has a disability application on file and they're making a determination regarding disability that there would be a final determination regarding participation. And at that time, the member would still be given one more chance to submit any further documentation in support of its claim. I'm, I'm, I'm really glad that this, this latest opportunity is, is being provided, but I also, and dismayed and disappointed that agencies aren't able to provide the, the qualifying information and that where they're not able to provide qualifying information that this is acceptable. Having 
been a lifelong public servant, having served at recovery efforts, I would, <laughs> if, if need be, and the New York City Transit Authority was not be able, able to provide timesheets and, 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 and pay stubs and, and assignments, uh, uh, would be just ridiculous, no matter what the time frame is that, that you don't know where and when your employees are at all times, that you are responsible for the employees. Um, there are things that occur that, you know, say someone was transporting as I, and um, at some point, not 9-11 related, there was, there was a lawsuit. They need to find out who was driving that vehicle, who was where at what time, otherwise um, the city is liable. Every effort would be made to find out who was that driver at that time, who was, whether it was in the area pulling all assignments and, and time cards. And um, th there's just a plethora of ways for them to know where their employees were at any given time. And I, I find it really unacceptable that folks have, have been denied whether this opportunity um, uh, has been, is being provided for them not now is, is really a slap in the face for those who have served and, and potentially have been uh, denied a benefit that not that just that they're entitled to that they so sorely need. So um, whatever provisions that are in place, I hope that it is not just um, the board uh, that are making these decisions that certainly, that, and, and agencies that they're talking with, with, with workers and, and those bargaining units that represent those workers to understand the nuances of each individual agency so that they can identify ways to tell whether or not a person was there. That is pretty ridiculous that someone is being denied such a crucial, critical, life-saving benefit because an agency which they serve, which has provided uh, services to all of our citizens of the city, not just during that time of 9-11, can't provide their whereabouts. That's pretty unacceptable. And um, I, I would hope that we will do all that we can moving forward. Furthermore, um, I would love to hear from uh, Police Pension some of the things that they have in place uh, in ways that they were able to address some of the nuances is that um, that caused denials on the other side, uh, uh, being able to identify or prove participation and, um, and also whether or not your doctors were versed in World Trade Center um, condition as opposed to just apparently general practitioners. So uh, the New York City Police Pension Fund uh, medical Board, which is a subset of the Board of Trustees, similar to NICERS, is a panel of three independent doctors, one of whom is appointed by the Department of Health, one from the Department of Citywide Administrative Services, and the third directly from the Police Pension Fund Board of Trustees. We have several panels that meet regularly in Left Rack City that our members, both active and retired, appear in front of in conjunction with applications for disability retirement. We also have the verification process um, where our members have to file a notice of participation stating that they spent 40 hours participating in the rescue recovery and cleanup operations at the World Trade Center site, or they were present for the first 48 hours from when the first plane hit the first tower. Uh, the police pension fund works very closely with the New York City Police Department in order to verify our members. We have uh, dedicated personnel at the police pension fund who do review uh, police department records, such as command entry logs, roll calls, overtime slips, uh, et cetera, to ensure that we can prove that our members were down there if in fact uh, they were. And then once that documentation is culled, it's given to the Board of Trustees who ultimately makes the determination as to whether or not the members' participation can be verified. 
Thank you. Um, so NYSA, are, are we using best practices and, and, and collaborating with the police pension as to how we can identify, first of all, participation? And then secondly, do we have anyone from uh, your panel of, of independent doctors? Where do they come from? Second question. As far as coordinating as police does, police, the police pension fund has one employer that they call from, which is the police department. NYSERS has every agency in the city, including CUNY um, and Transit Authority, Health and Hospitals. So we would not be able to have the same access to records that police has. Um, and I'm not clear on what your second question was as far as. The first question was best practice. In, in terms of uh, being able to identify participation, she uh, uh, identified a litany of ways to identify whether or not people were actually at ground zero. Um, it, I think it would behoove NYSA to, uh, to adopt some of those policies and identifying, uh, if you haven't already done, so my question was about uh, best practices. But you also, you know, you, you have the MLC, and the collaboration of agencies and the collaboration of bargaining units, and I'm, I'm not understanding why workers aren't being represented on the board. I wouldn't say that agencies are not responding to us, but as I said, some of them have records that were destroyed um, because they were stored in basements and they were destroyed during Superstorm Sandy. Um, and we work very closely. We have three union representatives on our board. We have DC 37. We have Teamsters Local 237 and Transport Workers Union Local 100. So we do have labor representation, which is very um, active in assisting members to get more information. So we do, re we do have a lot of reach out in that, in that respect. Also, since um, the hearings at the State Senate have occurred, NYSERS and the Mayor's Office have reached out to the various agencies and, and given them the specific names of um, people that need to be verified to ask for assistance. And we have received a bunch back, which um, denotes um, Melanie's report back in July that the number of um, notices were decreasing. So we have been in contact with a bunch of the agencies to try and, and help them as much as we can. But the burden is on the agency based on the law. Okay, uh, before, before you go, just for the record, could you identify those agencies whose paperwork were lost in Superstorm super Sandy? That I don't know off the top of my head, but I can certainly get that information back to you. Do you know how many of the agencies, how many agencies it were? I don't know. Okay, could you, uh, the council will be sending a letter with additional questions. I ask that uh, you respond appropriately and timely. And I- Can I, 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 can yep. I just point out one other thing, which is that um, sometimes verification is not about the agencies not receiving information, but it's because the law requires that the member participate for 40 hours of rescue, recovery, and cleanup, and it has to be rescue, recovery, and clean cleanup as defined by the law. So there are times when it's not the agency's fault, it's that the member doesn't qualify under the law. But that wouldn't be participation, right? Uh, in terms of whether or not the person was there, whether or not they qualified based on, so you're saying based on a particular part, the particular type of work that was performed? Yes. yes. Based on the type of work, a member has to, in order to, for a notice of participation to be verified by an agency, a member must either have participated on September 11th of 2001, September 12th of 2001 at any time for any period of time, or for 40 hours between September 11th, 2001 and September 12th of 2002. And they must have participated in rescue, recovery, and cleanup operations, which is defined by, in general terms, as um, having participated and has been clarified by the law department. But what is that? So, so again, if, if the folks that I represented at the MTA uh, were responsible for transporting from ground zero to ground zero and other locations throughout the city, and they met the 40-hour requirement, would they then meet the requirements of, of the work specifications? In a broad sense, and every case is very 
specific, it's hard to talk in broad sense, but in a broad sense, if the person participated for 40 hours in doing the job that you are describing, most likely they would have qualified, whether the agency has qualified them or the special trial, I mean, special review committee of NICERS has qualified them, depends on whether the agency has records or whether the person has come and testified before NICERS and has established that work. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony, it's been, it's been helpful. Um, I, as I said, we, we, we do have further questions that we'll send and, and, and um, some of the things that you weren't able to respond to appropriately today, we're hoping that we'll receive that as well. But the conversation as we move forward, uh, obviously we've learned some things today that, uh, it, that we hope to work with some of our colleagues on the state side to be able to amend and advance uh, opportunities for, uh, for people to get the benefit that they deserve. So thank you. Our next testimony will be from Ellie England of the UFT. Please. Okay. Good morning, Chairs Miller and Levine, and to the members of the Committee on Civil Service and Labor and the Committee on Health. <clears throat> My name is Ellie Angler, and I'm the Executive Assistant to President Michael Mulgrew of the United Federation of Teachers, and I'm also the Director of Staff. I want to thank you and the entire New York City Council for this opportunity for standing up for the health of the survivors of 9-11. Everybody has been saying thank you and feeling grateful, but I am very dismayed and dis disappointed in the testimony I've heard thus far. About 20 years ago, I was brought into the United Federation of Teachers and in, as an industrial hygienist. Randy Weingarten asked me to join the union, and I have a little story to tell you about myself, which will lead me into an ask of this committee, and it's a major ask. Came into the union representing a couple hundred thousand staff member, members and a million kids. And I started doing my work on school construction, asbestos, lead in the water, things like that, communicable diseases. And I had um, a role in developing citywide protocols for doing construction and renovation in school buildings while schools were occupied. This expertise took on a whole new meaning in the af aftermath of 9-11. <clears throat> I have to find my page two, which has disappeared on me. So 9-11 um, happens. The chancellor was um, Chancellor Levy. And Randy Weingarten and Chancellor Levy stood on the promenade and watched the buildings fall. I was on my way through the Holland Tunnel, through the, um, the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel, it's called something else though, into my office to take a look at some buildings down in Chinatown and I was called by a member of Division of School Facilities, Bernie Orlan, a good friend of mine who currently still works at um, Board of Education. I also was called by Alex Lampert, another good friend of mine who works at School Construction Authority. Both of them told me, don't go in. It was the 
time when you had a telephone that was as big as a shoebox in your car. I don't know if you remember that, but that was that time. The towers fell, and our first concern was how did these kids get out? And my members, my union, nurture over a million kids in school buildings, and some way, somehow, they carried kids in wheelchairs down the steps, they carried them up the West Side Highway, they took them home with them, they walked across the Brooklyn Bridge, they did whatever was necessary to make the children safe. And that's exactly what happened. Not one child was hurt after 9-11. Some of them stayed in the school until the coast was clear. So what was gonna happen? We came together as a team, School Construction Authority, the UFT and DOE, and we figured out number of schools, which ones, we had to decide, the DOE decided, had to be relocated to other sites. And as a team, we worked together to relocate all these kids. And I remember the union having vans packed, we were up on, on 21st Street, packed with textbooks and construction paper and all kinds of things because they were going to schools that were, they were co-locating with or other buildings. And I cannot tell you what a great effort and what a great team we were in the DOE, UFT, and um, SCA. We worked together terrifically. Several days of, after 9-11, a team of us, three from the UFT, more from the DOE, more from School Construction Authority, began our hunt in the 10 or 11 schools that closed around the towers. Those schools were evacuated. We had our mental health experts in the schools making sure that the kids who saw this horrific event and the teachers who saw this had the support they needed. And we started top to bottom, roof to basement, looking at what the buildings looked like, assessing the dust, assessing the vents, uh, conducting air monitoring, reviewing the results, and figuring out how are you ever gonna open this school in the zone of the World Trade Center. As time went on, we all know that EPA told us the air was safe, and there was a reopening of the schools. It didn't happen overnight. The first school to reopen was Stuyvesant, and then there was a rolling admissions of school, um, a rolling re-entry of schools into their buildings, I think, through March. So after that happened, March, we went back to business. I was dealing with tuberculosis. I was dealing with <clears throat> communicable diseases. I was dealing with lead in water, asbestos. Uh, that was my job. Oddly enough, in August of 2016, the AFL-CIO gave me a big award, the Zadroga Award. And I was very proud to receive it, and I thought it honored my work during 9-11. Very proud, it hangs on my wall today. But here's the kicker. That's all I thought. I put it up on my wall. And it wasn't until my two close friends, Michael Barash and Richard Allies, asked to meet with me. So Bridget Ryan, another good friend and colleague of mine, set up a meeting, and we sat down and talked. And they said, Ellie, what are you doing about your members? I said, my members? What do you mean, my members? What, what should I be doing about my members? Well, they're survivors, as you both pointed out. And I'll get to the big ask in a minute. I had done nothing. I had done nothing from 2001, the passage, passage of Zadroiga, the reauthorization, till that day I sat down with these two gentlemen. It hadn't occurred to me that not only were my members survivors that came back to work and worked there through May, but I myself was a responder we were, we were searching buildings for dead body parts and through the, we were looking in ventilation systems, looking at rugs, doing air testing. What a meeting that was. What a meeting that was. So just to let you know, three people on my UFT team, two of us have cancer, myself being one, 
and my other colleague. One has, has not gotten cancer. I can't speak for DOE or a school construction authority about their teams, but two out of three of us have gotten cancer since our exposure, heavy exposure to the 9-11 air. So as a result of that, um, we did some research. No one ever did re outreach to us, no one. I got this award and I met with these two gentlemen who said, what about you? What about your members? I am certified as a, a first responder and we began the process of identifying every member that worked in the, in the buildings during 2001 and 2002. We went through per payroll records, as you said, and found every single member, and there was approximately 1,000 of them. What we did after that was we sent out letters, we've held three or four forums, and the numbers of cancer-related illnesses, asthma, respiratory diseases, is astounding. And to this day, when we continue to reach out to these, we've, we've done a reach out five times, and we continue to have forums. We've had one at, at Stuyvesant, we had one in Chinatown, and then we had one in my office um, at 52 Broadway about two weeks ago. 25 people showed up from those that received letters. One in particular I'll tell you about. An Asian woman taught in Chinatown, lives in Chinatown. She just came because she got the message and said, let me see what this is about. I did a presentation, as did the attorneys. They're not pitching for clients, they're giving me information, and I'm just giving my members information because no one has ever done outreach to my members. But my members have a good union that protects them. A little late, but we're doing it. This Asian woman turned to me and said, I have cancer. I taught in Chinatown. My husband died of cancer. He lives in Chinatown. My cousin has cancer. That's just an example of a member coming to a meeting, not expecting anything, and realizing that she was entitled to health care, to benefits, to compensation. We will continue to do our work. With all due respect, the city says, and the health department says they've reached out. They have not reached out. It's up to you. I just got a call from a custodian who was diagnosed with, uh, the attorneys for a custodian who was diagnosed with leukemia, and he doesn't know how to get his records. So I personally wrote to the Board of Education and got documentation for him that he was actually working in Murray Bertram during that period in the zone. So we continued our talk, and I realized a light bulb went off. What about the kids? What about the kids? We're talking about a five-year-old in kindergarten who went to school every day as soon as schools op opened up. I'm not even talking about the 10 that were closed. I'm talking about the ones in Chinatown, Murray Bertram, the uh, elementary schools. They walked through that zone every day. Today, that five-year-old is what, 22? A high school, a, a senior from high school at Stuyvesant is what, 32, 33, is that right? Something like that. What about all those kids? The Department of Education and New York City Department of Health has done nothing, zero, nothing to reach out to those kids. And that's what I'm asking you for today. Because how many of those kids from 22 to 32 know that a cancer that they've developed, and there are many of them, is related to the exposure that they had while walking to school? getting off the subway, walking to school, leaving their apartment, walking to school. They have done nothing. The story about having records flooding out, flooded out during Hurricane Sandy has come to me too. They said, Stives, oh, the basement got so wet. 234, the basement was wet, and that's where the records are. But I know that the health department has records of every child. You can't get into school unless the health department know, knows you've been immunized. And that has to be in a database. And they have done nothing. 
So I come to the council, I will protect my members, I will meet with TRS, I will meet with Burroughs to make sure they have a good understanding uh, of what it means to, to see my members who have deceased, my members that need a disability, and review all of their records, because I can identify every person that has been exposed. I will meet with DC 37, with um, 32BJ, with the custodial union. I'll do the work of the union that the city hasn't done for us. What I'm asking you to do is help me get the city to get those, use whatever methods they have. This isn't a lot of money. Post on Facebook. Take out some ads, do some digital stuff. But any child that was in school has the right to know, the right to know that they had an exposure, a serious exposure, and they've never been told. I ask for your help. We will devote staff from the union to help in any way we can. We're committed to doing that. President Mulgrew has given me the assurances that ev whatever we need to do, if it's going down into the basement and getting those records, we will do it. We will find those children. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that testimony. And, and, and I just want you to know that um, the purpose of this hearing, while we, 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 you know, we, we're hearing a resolution, um, we want to talk about workers, but the purpose is to ensure that we're, we're looking at all the unintended consequences, that we're capturing the entire universe and talking about those who haven't been spoken about, that they have a voice here today, which certainly you have just given them, and, and the council is, is going to work with you and the UFT and the others to make sure that, that we capture that entire universe and that everyone has been impacted, that, um, that we know who they are and that they're be being provided the services that uh, they are entitled to. But with that, I, I want to pass it over to the, to the chair of the health. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Ellie, I have to say that's one of the most powerful testimonies I've ever seen in my five years in the council. And your bravery in standing up and telling your personal story and advocating not for yourself. No, and not for my members. Yes, and so to, to critics of, uh, of organized labor who think that it's only about uh, defending their members, I mean, you are a perfect example of the broader vision, especially of teachers who uh, obviously are in this work because they care about the kids first and foremost, and you are perfectly reflecting that. So I thank you uh, from the bottom of my heart for speaking out for the kids. Um, it seems to me that the city should know, uh, down to the last name, exactly who were the children who were in schools in proximity to Ground Zero during this critical period. So we must have a list. I don't know how many kids are on the list, hundreds, maybe a few thousand. A few th uh, thousands. So we must have a list of those names, and uh, some of them are going to still be, well, maybe, at this point, none would still be in the schools, but we would have a last known address. Uh, we might have a last known phone number. Um, that would be a starting point. So have we not mailed letters to the last known address, for example, of these several thousand now former students? The city has not. The Department of Education, uh, claims that there's no such list. But, and the health department has no such list? No, they say but, not. I know they do, but I, they say not. It, it wouldn't require much work. Uh, again, this is knowable information. These are children who are enrolled in schools within a certain geographic zone during that critical, basically, it's, it's, it's one school year, basically. Yeah. Right? So it's the school year of, of 01 to 02 who were enrolled in a certain geographic area. Uh, you've probably thought about, it. maybe it's a one mile radius, um, I'm not sure. We know, we, the, the schools below, below Canal Street, and then I guess some below Houston, but the ones below Canal had more direct exposure. Okay, so uh, I and we are very committed to Thank see you. that we identify the kids and do everything we can to reach them. And that seems to me to be quite doable. 
Uh, and I also endorse your idea of some broader outreach on social media because there are going to be some families who have moved and who we can't easily reach. But let's at least start by mailing to the known address, calling to the last known phone number, um, and then move to working with alumni groups and other possible channels to reach out to these kids. Uh, I, I'm personally, and I think I can say that my co-chair, are absolutely committed to doing that. And I again want to thank you for that very, very moving, brave testimony that you offered. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ellen. Okay, next up we are going to hear from Oren Vizali from uh, FDNY EMS Local 2507, from uh, Linda Mercer and her, and her colleague Matthew McCauley, from Stephen Landau, Stephanie. sorry, Stephan La Stephanie Landau, forgive me, Mary Fetchett from the Voices of September 11th. If you all could please make your way up. Hi. Okay. And are, are you Oren? Is that correct? Oren, okay. yes. Would you like to lead us off, please? Sure, if you don't mind. Okay. And um, just protocol, we ask that you start by stating your name and organization. Sure. My name is Oren Barzalay, president of FDNY EMS Local 2507. Good morning, and thank you for having me today, for allowing me to testify in front of you. Deaths from September 11 cause diseases currently greatly outnumber those lost on that fateful day. We at FDNY EMS lost two members, Carlos Lilo, Ricardo Queen, to the terrorist attack. In the course of the last 17 years, 100 additional members have made a supreme sacrifice in service to our great city. Our active duty workforce on 9-11 was 2,500. 431 are currently still on active duty and are being treated for 90 separate separate health conditions related to work at the World Trade Center. That equates to 17% of the workforce. Of those 431, 88 or 22% are currently battling cancer. It bears mentioning that the average age of these members is 49 years. They are now suffering from diseases that are normally seen in several generations Generians, I'm sorry. Asbestos-related cancers, notably lung cancer, can take 20 years for symptoms to show. These cancers are beginning to appear at an alarming rate. Bearing witness to that fact, in this month alone, I have attended the funerals of three of my members. That leaves mothers and fathers burying their children and spouse burying their loved ones. The well of backpipes and stately department, departmental funerals is but little consolation. We also have 700 retirees under treatment. These retirees, while a bit older, are developing acute health issues at an alarming rate. So of the 2,500 EMS members employed on that fateful day, 1,009 are being treated for health-related issues caused by the terror attack. We have rebuilt the World Trade Center. We have pledged that we will never forget. Yet problems still remain in the adju adjudication and administration of 9-11 related claims. The governor has legislated World Trade related diseases by presumptively related to, this, to the rescue and recovery efforts. But because of the link between a, a particular medical condition and World Trade Center exposure is not always definitive, 
the city has challenged a high portion of 9-11 related workers' compensation claims. The denial rate of NICERS, 9-11 disability pension, remains unchanged at around 50%. While much has been learned, the entire spectrum and trajectory of World Trade Center related disorders and their mechanism of onset persistence remain to be fully described. And while those mechanisms are continually evolving, we need to maintain, extend, and grant options to our members. While listening to other testify here today, I took some notes. There was questions whether the unions had to negotiate for this benefit. The fact is, we did have to negotiate. There is a give back. When our members, have to, when our members reach retirement, whatever sick leave bank they have, they have to return it to the city. In 17 years, our members endured unpaid sick leave days, hundreds of hours. Some of them have lost their homes, their spouses. Yet, when the governor legislated this benefit for the entire state, the city opposed it and we were left out. They wanted our vacation day on top of that, but we fought back. The only dignity we got was our vacation. Senator Marty Golden has been a, a staunch advocate on helping us. It's been a year since numerous nice hearings have been held. As of today, there's still no oncologist to examine our members. How does somebody with no experience in cancer examine our members? Some of them I have, been even, have been even diagnosed with PTSD, yet PTSD is not recognized as a medical condition under the World Trade Center Compensation Fund, therefore leaving our members stranded an appeal after an appeal still stranded. It leaves us no choice but now to go up to Albany again and legislate to include PTSD. Mental health is a serious issue. Anybody who experienced that day has some sort of mental issue. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Please. Uh, good morning. Uh, this is on, okay. Uh, good morning. I want to thank the committee for inviting us here today. My name is Mary Fetchett, and I'm founding director of Voices of September 11th an organization that I co-founded in 2001 following the death of my 24-year-old son, Brad, who was working on the 89th floor of the South Tower. I'm here today with Stephanie Landau, who's worked with Voices uh, for 11 years as program director, or 12 years as program director. At the time of the attacks, I was working as a clinical social worker and established voices to provide support services and access to resources and mental health care for all those impacted by 9-11. Over the past 17 years, our staff has provided over 160,000 hours of support services in a wide range of programs for victims' families, survivors, responders, and their families. And it's worth noting that um, the support services that we provided are funded by money that we actually raised privately. 
For six years, VOICE has worked along with other outreach partners to assist survivors and responders in accessing treatment through the World Trade Center Health Program. Today, we continue to be focused on providing continuity of care by working collaboratively to provide programs that address the long-term mental health needs of the 9-11 community. Our test testimony is focused on the long-term needs of 9-11 victims' family members, survivors, responders, and their families. The families of the 2,977 victims uh, lived around the country and around the world. Ninety countries lost citizens that day. Since 2001, the needs of victims' families have evolved. In 2015, Voices conducted a scientific research study uh, that was actually funded by the Canadian government to evaluate the long-term needs of 600 victims' families. The findings demonstrated that 15 years later, many families have a range of needs. A third of the family members who participated are resilient and have been able to integrate and accept the loss of their loved one and move forward in a productive way. A third have mental health needs that fluctuate from time to time, possibly based on subsequent losses, news of other tragedies, illness, or changes in their support system. A third of those who participated are still experiencing serious mental health conditions, such as depression, anxiety, and PTSD. Many families that we contacted about the study were actually unwilling to participate for a variety of reasons. Most indicated that reflecting back on their personal experience would be too painful, would reopen old wounds, or complicate their mental health conditions. Based on our research and our daily contact with 9-11 families, we have found long-standing mental health issues that have not been addressed for children of the victims who are now young adults, uh, which are complicated by misdiagnosis, intergenerational issues, substance abuse, and other developmental challenges. For example, a victim's child who was 13 years old at the time struggled through high school and college and was misdiagnosed and treated with stimulants for attention deficit disorder when in reality he had anxiety and depression. This in turn led to substance abuse and the need for years of private therapy. Another example of mental health stressor is the continued identification of human remains, which continues today. The office of the chief medical examiner's office of New York City still has 7,000 unidentified human remains. Of the 2,753 victims at the World Trade Center site, over 1,100 victims' families have never been uh, notified. Many families have, by choice, have been notified multiple times. Our family has been notified six times of our son's remains, uh, the most recent just three months ago. Over 17 years later, we receive calls from victims' families that are contacting us for the first time asking for support services. Many have never sought mental health treatment and their conditions have been magnified due to other losses, lack of support, and unforeseeable circumstances out of their control. As far as the survivors, in 2006, Voices worked with Morgan Stanley to analyze a number of survivors who were present in Lower Manhattan on 9-11. The study indicated that over 400,000 people lived, worked, or went to school within a quarter of a mile of the World Trade Center on 9-11. Of that number, only about 18,000 survivors are currently enrolled in the World Trade Center Health Program, 
and many do not know they qualify or that it's still open. Some survivors still reside in the area, yet others have relocated to other parts of the country, which may, makes it much more complicated uh, than to make them aware of the program. Some survivors have become sick and sought treatment for illnesses with their own private medical doctors, not recognizing the, the connection with their exposures at the World Trade Center site. As an example, we received a call from the husband of a woman who worked at a, at a school in the area and was diagnosed with brain cancer. Her husband called the day before her surgery, wondering if she should apply to the program. We helped expedite her application. Some terminally ill survivors never recognize the connection between the 9-11 related exposure and it's not until many years after their death that their families contact us asking for help. Although though they've perished, we can assist the families by connecting them with the attorneys that are helping them apply for the Victims' Compensation Fund. The overlooked survivor community are the thousands of individuals who worked in the World Trade Center building but just didn't happen to be at work that day. Many of them lost hundreds of friends and colleagues that day and were tasked with rebuilding their companies. Recognition of their need for support varies from company to company. Nearly 75,000 responders are currently registered in the World Trade Center Health Program. John Feel, who has been working tirelessly in helping responders apply to the program, is here today. Um, and we're often contacted by responders who have moved out of the area, who came from other parts of the country to work in the re rescue and recovery effort. For instance, we were contacted by a response team from Phoenix, Arizona, who had 42 colleagues who came to the area and they actually worked with one of the attorneys uh, to get them into the compensation program. As of September 30th, I know this came up earlier, um, two, uh, 2009. Susan, I'm sorry, we, we, do, we do have, uh, we have to be out of here. Oh, this okay. is another hearing, so I'm asking you to please wrap up, summarize and wrap up. Well, I know, I know you mentioned about the 2,000, uh, there's 2,104 um, people that are on record that have died since 9-11. Uh, and I think that's an underestimate, actually, of the people that have died because it's really not recognizing the people that committed suicide. And it's also not recognizing the people that may have died and not recognized it until after, um, after they have um, deceased when the family approaches us. And I'm going to turn it over to Stephanie. Thank you. <clears throat> so overall, the challenges we're trying to describe are very, very significant for the families, the survivors, and the responders. It's very confusing. There are multiple, multiple layers of services that are provided. A lot of them all have the same name. You've got the Victim Compensation Fund, the World Trade Center um, Health Program, then you, they have a survivor program, responder program, a national program, and there's really no way for pe to, that we try to help people navigate through all these systems. And we just really wanted to make sure that you were aware that there's a lot of challenges to these systems that are there. Their families have no support. A lot of time family members are sick. They're taking care of somebody who is sick. Um, and they have nobody supporting them. They have to give up their time to take people to their medical treatments that also may not be recognized as time off. So it's a very, very complicated system, and they really, really need help navigating it. And this is only going to get worse, as was mentioned. With asbestos-related diseases, you're going to have a lot more families that are going to be depending and looking to the city for services. Um, what we would like to do, really to conclude, is that we're here today to support the entire 9-11 community. Uh, we would like to applaud all the centers of excellence who provide incredible, compassionate uh, expertise in taking care of everybody who has gotten sick. We would also like to uh, give a little shout out to John Feel and all the attorneys that are here who represent the survivors and responders and their families with great empathy, 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 that was hard, as they continue to battle for additional funding for the victim's compensation and for fair treatment and sick leave for all those who've been impacted. 
And I know you mentioned best practices. I think we've learned a lot over the last 17 years, and I'm hoping that it's taken into account um, what we've learned um, if, God forbid, uh, you know, there's another uh, attack or acts of mass violence. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so very much. We've been joined by Council Member Barron, and I'm going to allow uh, my co-chair here to kind of jump right in. And I'll pick um, Mr. Uh, Barzola, thank you for your very, very powerful testimony. Uh, it's hard to think of any group of workers who have uh, more clearly sacrificed on behalf of the city in service in the post-9-11 period and have uh, clearly deserve uh, every measure of support we can offer, Thank including you. undoubtedly support for those who suffer from PTSD. And I just want to, want to ask you to clarify, because when, when I look at the statistics from the World Trade Center Health Program, they do list PTSD as one of their conditions. In fact, it's one of the most common um, for both responders and survivors. Um, so they'll you, treat it, but they don't, they don't it, financially right. support it. Okay, so they're tracking this condition without offering financial support. And is correct. that accurate? Correct. Yeah. That's correct. Okay. Uh, and that, that means support for mental health services and paid sick days, et cetera? Correct. Could you, are those so, the two so, things? So if you're permanently disabled, let's say, from a mental condition, you're entitled to an award, whether it's a pension, three-quarter disability, that's not recognizable. Okay, so it's, it's qualification for the pension, uh, perhaps paid sick. Uh, From the World Trade well. Center Fund. Right. It's not, it's not you're not entitled to, to a claim. Okay, well clearly it should be in the fact that we're tracking this as a medical condition. Uh, yeah. There's a contradiction in the city's response to this and we, we, we thank you for highlighting that contradiction and we certainly support you on that. Thank you. Can I clarify that a little bit? The Zadroga Act created two sort of equal branches. One is the Victim Compensation Fund, which is financial rewards, and that does not include any mental health awards. On the other hand, you have the World Trade Center Health Program, which has all sorts of variations, but, which is why it gets confusing. They will treat, they will, phys they will actually provide treatment, but no financial compensation. So you can go in for counseling, but if it makes it so you can't work, it doesn't get included in your financial compensation. So they're recognizing it, but they're not recognizing it as a financial loss. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so if th there's a lot going on here and, and you've provided a, a just a, a, a plethora of, of really credible and nece necessary testimony here today and, and pretty much answered most of the questions that we have here about what are next steps, um, what has not been done, have we kind of captured that universe uh, uh, of everybody that is being impacted and, and, and certainly your collective testimonies have, have dealt with that, but if we had to prioritize um, initiatives, programs, and, and uh, as we move forward, um, what would be our first steps and what would be those priorities? For me, Jean. Um, from my perspective and for, for everybody that's involved with FDNY, I would say uh, some issues with NICES have to be uh, adjusted getting them the appropriate funding for maybe the doctors that we're asking for, the specialists. Um, you know, uh, you have members with cancers who are being diagnosed with PTSD, fatigue, uh, instead of being authorized a cancer diagnosis for, for their retirement. So I, I think that we've acknowledged that piece there, and, and I personally have a lot of experiences with with with, in, uh, with uh, IMEs, and they they never work <laughs> for workers. Um, uh, I, I think that we're addressing that. More importantly, I 
think the hearings that our colleagues did in, in Albany has really shined light on that. And because of that, they have brought other individuals in. But we're going to keep this at the forefront. And, and certainly, um, that's why we have these hearings, right, to give voices to those who, who have been historically uh, d disenfranchised around these areas here. And that is, quite frankly, unacceptable. Uh, I think they've begun to make changes, and we're going to stay, stay on them to make sure that they have credible, qualified folks making these determinations and that we close these, these disparity gaps about who is receiving a qualified uh, uh, disability pension um, and who's not. And, and so certainly that's something that we want to deal with. Um, from, from, from a civilian standpoint, what are the next steps? Well, I think there's still a lot of stigma attached to mental health. And, you know, that's something that has to be ge addressed generally. But, you know, I'm just struck by, um, you know, victims and, and people that are directly affected by John Feel and, and others that have to come forward um, to push the government to do what should be, you know, common sense. You know, so I think to, to, to really look at the bigger picture and, and for you all to be thinking about how can you move this forward? How can you simplify it for these people? How can you do what's right so that people have both the mental health and the medical care that they need and deserve? Okay, thank you. Um, I hope that we've seen that, that, that the, the, the city of New York, at the very least, have, have, have really taken steps to understanding in general mental health issues, but in particularly as it pertains to those survivors and, and, uh, and, and family members of survivors and the unintended consequences that they have had there and that we, that we have a responsibility uh, to, to provide them with the necessary services. And I, I think just the dialogue and the conversations that we've had over the past five years in communities throughout the city and particularly around 9-11 that, that we are addressing that. But we want to continue this dialogue. Well, if I could just add, I think one thing that makes things difficult is having to fight for things that you deserve. And, and when there's multiple organizations and agencies providing a small sliver of what the, the support should be, uh, it makes it very difficult for people to navigate. So I think to, uh, to think about a collaboration and um, messaging and, and making things easy because uh, the navigation of many of these issues is what, is what complicates their mental health um, conditions. Okay, thank you so very much for your testimony. Uh, we, I'm sorry, we, we have Council Member Adams. Thank you, uh, Chair Miller. I, I just wanted to make a comment uh, and, and thank the co-chairs uh, uh, for continuing this dialogue. You know, the, the more we peel this, this onion back, the more layers there seem to be. And I just really appreciate your testimony here today, your passionate testimony here today. I happen to have a family member uh, who was diagnosed for a third or fourth time three months ago with another illness as a direct result uh, of being a first responder on 9-11. So I, I certainly do sympathize and em empathize uh, with everything that you've said here today. So thank you very much. Uh, in addition to that, uh, testimony that was provided by Ellie Engler a little while ago from UFT where she reached out uh, and she was very, very passionate about the children and wanting to get information to the children and families of the children. This information that you've provided in your packet, 9-11 Were You There, specifically addresses her concern. Mm -hmm. and, and, and for our estimation or my estimation, it looks like this is the answer that she was looking for to that question. How are we reaching uh, the children? How are we reaching the families that continue to be impacted impacted some 10, 15, 20 years later and beyond. This issue is going to affect and has affected generations in the city of New York and beyond even for those that aren't even in the state of New York. So when we look at this picture for us right here uh, in, in New York City, we're taking a look through a small lens right now at New York City alone, and then as we peel back this onion, we're taking a look at a wider uh, instance of teachers and people that may have just been walking down the street, students, young and old, 
Also, we can take a look at people that came in to assist from other from other areas of the country. Across this country, we had numerous individuals that came to that pile to assist. So uh, I, I'm just going to uh, ask that this information be shared with UFT and others. Uh, were you there? This answers that question in trying to get more information in and more information out to those that may have been involved and so critically impacted on 9-11. So thank you again very much. Thank you so very much for your testimony. Our final panel, uh, Linda Mercer, Matthew McCauley, John Phil, Michael Baresh, and Leonard Sorge. we get started, I'd like to acknowledge my good friend Richie Ailes there, who has, has been on the forefront for, for obviously for nearly two decades now, and continues to be, so. Give your name and testimony. I'm sorry. Good morning, my name is Linda Mercer. I am a traffic agent. I worked for the NYPD over 30 years. Um, I had served many mayors and before, before the mayor we have now. Um, I have been diagnosed with cancer from 9-11 I'm certified by the, uh, the Royal Cray Center Helper. I have been, um, been treated. I do dialysis. The cancer left from my breast to my nipple. Right now, um, I suppose I had an operation. They couldn't do it because the cancer is so much on my nipple. So the doctor said, um, I'm going to be on chemo, chem I'm sorry, chemo for the rest of my life. But now, um, I don't have no sick time. I was standing on the step in October, in, in, on the mail step, and asking him to sign for the traffic, all the traffic agents, all the city workers that was down at 9-11. I was told that he signed it. But as of this day, I just still don't have unlimited sick time. Come January 4th of 2019, I gotta go back and do more chemo. And my doctor told me this is gonna be a heavy dose of chemo that I won't be able to come to work. So I don't have no sick time. So I'm asking y'all to please help me. I have to support my family. Without no sick time, I can't go to work. I won't get paid. So, please, thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Due to the fact I'm in NYPD and they have unlimited sick time, I feel that traffic should have unlimited sick time too, because we in that unit, we in that um, NYPD. So. Thank you. I want to uh, thank the chair and the council for today's hearing. I want to wish everybody here a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year, Happy Hanukkah, Happy Kwanzaa, whatever you celebrate, happy that. I especially want to thank Linda Mercer, and I want to, I want to wish her a, a Merry Christmas. So let me start by uh, saying we shouldn't be here today talking about sick leave for 9-11 responders. We shouldn't be here at all. 
But for the record, I have no part in this game. I have no skin in this game. I'm not represented by a union. I am a 9-11 responder who lost half of my foot. I was diagnosed with post-traumatic. I got my BCF award. I could have went to an island this holiday season. But I stuck around for the last 15 years. Helped pass nine pieces of legislation in D.C., Albany, New Jersey, and Michigan for free. I've even donated over $5 million in a kidney. But I have no skin in this game other than seeing what's just. Two years ago, my team walked the halls of Congress, then we stopped to walk the halls of Albany to get a bill passed. Along with the 9-11 Health Watch and others, we wanted responders like Linda Mercer and hundreds of others who responded to 9-11 who became deathly ill because of their heroic actions to get sick leave. Unlimited sick leave because of their heroic actions. Working with State Senator Kaminsky and Senator Golden, we walked the Capitol and the state to mandate all 9-11 responders get unlimited sick time. Governor Cuomo supported it. We passed it, and it was signed into law in September of 2017. And while there were some problems in the beginning, they were ironed out, and now there are others getting unlimited sick time. Under the state law that the mayor has opposed, there are agencies like the New York State Police, the Port Authority, Suffolk County Police, New York State Court Officers, and other agencies that have worked out this without any conflicts or no need for negotiating or collecting a bargaining. And keep in mind, no one had to protect or negotiate to help their members affected by 9-11 and say after mass. Yet Linda Mercer still sits here eight days before Christmas without unlimited sick time because it hasn't been negotiated and will most likely die before the mayor of New York City simply does the right thing. Negotiate. You have to know what you're talking about in order to have a negotiation. And while I have not seen the contract, I know firsthand that this contract is flawed and it hurts its members. I am baffled that the parties involved decided it was a good idea to negotiate for a benefit that was already law. I am dumbfounded they felt it was not necessary to speak to anyone who was involved with passing the bill in 2017. But yet they hijacked our press conference six weeks ago. They tried to play savior. They've tried to play hero. That title's reserved for those who suffer from illnesses. But the locals and the mayor, mayor's office, apparently know nothing about what they were talking about, but managed to completely screw up a very simple concept that had bipartisan support and the governor's support. So let me make this clear. Make it, make it simple for those who have no skills and successful leadership skills. If you were a responder at 9-11 and you got sick from your exposure, then you are entitled to unlimited sick time. Now, I understand the mayor and his labor team are telling all the unions, take, take what has already been negotiated or get nothing. I am here to tell everybody, tell every union, do not negotiate with the mayor's office because we'll be back in Albany in January to get legislation passed so nobody has to negotiate and get force-fed with the mayor's office's they were disingenuous earlier to you guys. I hope you know they were playing you. That's off the record and now on the record. And I am sure, with the help of proven leaders like Governor Cuomo, Andrea Stewart-Cousins, and Senator Flanagan, we will get this done before the mayor and his team figure out what they know what they're doing. In closing, the parties that negotiated for something that was already a legal right will have blood on their hands when people like Linda die without unlimited sick time. So I leave you with a quote by Ben Franklin. We are all born ignorant, but one must work hard to remain stupid. Thank you. Uh, my name is Leonard Sorgi. I am perhaps by happenstance attending today and actually speaking with you today, only as a result of the very positive things 
I heard from the council that I decide to raise what I believe is an issue that has been ignored over the years. It results from the fact that I spent some time considering my family's situation as 9-11 survivors. Uh, my wife was diagnosed with breast cancer 45 months after 9-11. Uh, we lived in Battery Park City. I was there on 9-11. We returned home at the city's insistence, the government's insistence. They were interested in restoring lower Manhattan to a, being a vibrant community. We were assured it was safe. My wife very much wanted <clears throat> to move away. Uh, I insisted it was safe and we stayed. And, and my wife is fine today. She recovered from her breast cancer, has done very well. But in looking into the issue, uh, I came to understand from an April 2006 New York City Health Register report that some 900 people were identified as having been in the contamination zone, having contracted cancer after 9-11, but most likely those people were denied benefits through the World Trade Center Health Program, and I perhaps by New York City as well, I don't know, because their cancer was deemed to have manifested too soon. So again, for example, my wife was deemed to have been diagnosed with cancer 12 weeks too early. So she's not a victim of 9-11. I will say she certainly considers herself a victim of 9-11. So what I would like to ask is that New York City, this council, look into that issue. Uh, the World Trade Center Health Program, Dr. Howard, set a 48-month uh, minimum latency period before he'll consider a can cancer patient to be a victim. Uh, that's based upon ambiguous science given cancer triggering event and latency is, is very much unknown. Uh, Dr. Howard, in setting the policy for the World Trade Center Health Program, specifically stated his goal was to ensure, quote, no false negative, close quote, decisions. Yet, yet the 48-month solid cancer latency period they set, they eventually decided upon, clearly leaves behind cancer victims who whose cancer resulted from 9-11. And I don't know who oversees the World Trade Center Health Program and these sort of scientific dis rules and regulations that they set. This is, this is a critical rule that ends up eliminating probably at least 1,000 cancer patients from, from uh, the group recognized as being victims. And I would like or would ask that New York City, on behalf of what are mostly New York New Yorkers investigate and consider whether there is a, 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 an avenue for advocating on behalf of those thousand or so people with the federal government to, to revisit what's an appropriate latency period. Should it still be 48 months? I've seen data in the last seven years where there have been many instances of cancer developing in less than 48 months. Uh, so again, uh, I'm not quite certain the proper avenue to have that issue considered, but I do think given these are New Yorkers who are being ignored, who are being told they are not victims, that somehow it would be helpful for the council to, to consider that issue. And if it would be appropriate, I'd be more than willing to sit with your staff at some time and, and speak a little bit more about it. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you very much. I want to thank you, to thank the City Council for holding this hearing today, and can only hope that we can accomplish some things that are long overdue. My name is Matthew McCauley. I was a 9-11 first responder myself. I represent Linda Mercer along with many other 9-11 responders and survivors who become ill as a result of their exposure to the toxic dust and debris from the World Trade Center site. You've heard from John Field and the passion he has for the 9-11 community to ensure that they get what they are due and not forgotten. I presented at many of the same meetings he has spoken at as well. It was at these meetings, chaired by members of the New York State Senate and Assembly, that we first discussed the inequality being faced by New York City 9-11 responders when it came to getting their unlimited sick time. It took those meetings to get us where we are here today, here, 
still discussing why 9-11 New, New York City responders do not have the same benefits as the people they stood shoulder to shoulder with at Ground Zero, as well as the, the same people they, st they stand shoulder to shoulder with at the very frequent 9-11 responder funerals that we have on an average of three times per week now. However, that was actually not the purpose of those meetings. The purpose was to discuss and examine how 9-11 responders were being treated in the pension system, and more specifically, how they were being treated by NICERS. We had been hearing an increasing number of complaints by the New York City 9-11 responders that their World Trade Center pensions were being denied or strangely classified to PTSD while ignoring their life-threatening and physical illnesses. These meetings saw testimony from both 9-11 responders and the representatives from NICERS, including Executive Director Melanie Winery and General Counsel Elise Sislak. As a result of those meetings and following uh, suggestions that were made by John and others, NICERS met with members of the World Trade Center Health Program and the Victims' Compensation Fund to have a better understanding of how those programs work with 9-11 responders and to understand how the work that NICERS does impacts those programs. They worked to verify more notices of participation for its members. They created website pages and updated other pro others to provide information to its 9-11 responders. They showed that some changes could be made even more than 16 years after 9-11. However, they also identified issues that remain problematic. And given that NICERS is controlled by the mayor, all of these issues can be corrected if the mayor addresses them. Number one, NICERS is un un understaffed, both administratively and medically. 9-11 issues should be handled specifically by 9-11 teams. The World Trade Center Health Program, the 9-11 VCF, and the state have all shown that having teams focused on 9-11 responders gets the job done. Two, backlogs. They're still in a backlog verifying 9-11 responders' notices of participation. Much of that is due to the other agencies failing to respond to NICERS. You heard earlier uh, a testimony about the fact that some people in that may not be qualified. That doesn't count for those that have not had responses back. If they've affirmatively been told that they're not qualified, they're able to then go someplace and try to find information. NICERS has said openly in their, in their hearings that they've had agencies that couldn't actually respond back to them. It, it's 2018. They should not be a hesitation from an agency to respond back to NICERS. It's the city of New York. The mayor can order them to respond. And if they don't respond, then they should be de facto considered to be part of it, not held against it. Because right now what happens, if the agency doesn't respond back, it's on the responder's side to prove that they were there. They don't want affidavits from people that they were down there with. The Victims' Compensation Fund, and you know from Michael Barish about that. The Victims' Compensation Fund takes sworn affidavits. The World Trade Center Health Program takes sworn affidavits. The city agencies don't want sworn affidavits because they're concerned about fraud. Again, they're sworn affidavits. Everybody in here understands what the ramifications of lying in a sworn affidavit is. So the issues should be dealt with in a, in a different way. The appropriate physicians are not in place to review 9-11 cases. Experts from the World Trade Center Health Program and FDNY Medical Division, that would be Dr. Crane and Dr. Prezant, have met with them and offered advice to them. Yet they still do not have an oncologist to review cases on a regular basis. 9-11 cancer is devastating the 9-11 responder community. There are over 70 cancers approved by the World Trade Center Health Program as being 9-11 related. All of the major institutions on the East Coast have done or are doing 9-11 cancer research. Yet not one, onco one oncologist sits on the NICERS board with a, regular, with a regular position. And the same is true for an occupational health specialist. An boarded occupational health specialist, such as Michael Crane. Michael Crane from the World Trade Center Health Program offered to find them whatever doctors they needed to have. Now, we heard today that they don't have enough positions. We've been hearing that for more than a year now, that there's not enough positions and that needs to be changed. Why hasn't the mayor of the city changed that? It's just a matter of expanding the number of folks that can sit on the boards. Four, it still takes too much time to navigate the NICERS pension system, and it, and it often uh, requires an attorney to get the needed results, including appeals, as Councilman brought up before. These delays have a riffle effect on Social Security decisions because the members must be off payroll to qualify in most instances. They affect the VCF determinations when it comes to awards and often cause them to duplicate their work, which takes resources away from others as well as slows down the process. Because of the lack of unlimited sick time for its members, some are forced to take an ordinary pension in the face of financial ruin. So they actually have to abandon their pension, they, we, and we've had that. Jennifer Doherty was somebody who came in here and said that she had to make a decision and when she came to the state hearing, and she had to make a decision. She could take an ordinary pension because she had enough time to retire. She ran out of her sick time. She had no option or else she went no pay. And then that leaves the FDNY Honor Fund or John Feel or somebody to, to keep things going. So what did she do? 
she took the ordinary pension and she struggles every day with her cancer now. So now she has to go back and reclassify that ordinary pension. Now, it sounds pretty simple that, well, at least she's getting paid. She should still be on the books today if she had unlimited sick time and NYSERS could be working at least that part of it out. But she was forced to leave versus having financial ruin. There's more to be done here in the situation in New York City responder community is only getting worse. We call on the mayor to fix the issues. Lately, we've heard of 10-year plans to fix the New York City infrastructure, as well as NYCHA and other agencies. We need an immediate plan to fix the issues that plague the nine, nine NYSERS and elimin, elim, excuse me, eliminate the ripple effect. Greater transparency and accountability is also needed. The World Trade Center, the Victims' Compensation Fund, and all of the centers of excellence, and John will tell you this, he's been at the meetings, including those across the country, convene at least once a month to ensure that they're all on the same page. Do you think that means that there are concerns about the 9-11 community? They all come into New York, they all sit down. These are high-ranking practitioners and high-ranking government officials that meet every single month to make sure that everything is moving slowly within those organizations, moving together within those organizations. It's time for that body work to include members of NICERS. And if the medical board doesn't, if they don't want to do their own meetings, maybe they should attend some of the other ones themselves. Quick discussion about follow-up on the sick time and I will end. Why, why, why? has this not been implemented going forward for all New York City agencies. The mayor has said that he favors it, but it seems it's only on his own terms. There's no reason why every New York City responder by the end of today should not have at least sick time going forward. Linda Mercer will start 2019 without another, with another battery of chemotherapy and wondering how she will get up and go to work the next morning. There are many other Linda Mercers out there and more to come. Just do the right thing and protect them going forward and work everything else out. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Michael Barish, managing partner of the law firm Barish McGarry. I want to thank you for having us all here today as I uh, finish up. Uh, I'm joined here by my associate who's already been recognized, uh, former retired uh, FDNY Deputy Chief Richard Allies, who was former political and legislative director of the UFOA. I need not mention he was also a 9-11 first responder. Our law firm represents over 12,000 people in the 9-11 community. Nearly every day, a new person in our office, one of our clients or a new person calls us up to report that there's been another death. It's absolutely horrifying. Uh, one of my clients was NYPD detective James Z. Roga. Uh, Jimmy died of pulmonary fibrosis in 2006 at age 34. When they did an autopsy, they found ground glass in his lungs. Think about that. If he had that in his lungs, I submit that every responder, every school child, every resident, every office worker who was assured the air is safe and was invited to come back downtown, we all have that in our lungs. In addition to the ground glass, they found asbestos, chromium, lead, benzene, and a number of other known carcinogens in his lungs. And that was the evidence that doctors at NIOSH and the CDC needed to link what is now 68 cancers to the World Trade Center toxins. Everyone, whether they were uniform, non-uniform, was breathing the same toxic dust. According to NIOSH and the CDC, according to them, not attorneys, nearly 20,000 people so far have had cancers linked to the World Trade Center toxins, and because the delay it takes to get an appointment with the health program, there are thousands more waiting for an appointment to have their illnesses certified. 9,000 first responders nationwide 1,700 FDNY members and 8,000 civilians have been diagnosed with cancers. My firm alone, we were talking before, uh, Councilman Levine, you were asking about the students. My law firm alone represents 25 former students from Stuyvesant High School, Pace University, and BMCC with cancers. We're talking about 25-year-old women with breast cancer, 28-year-old men with bladder cancer. It's horrifying. Um, you know, these kids were told, come back to school. I'm sure those of you who were around at that time remember, they turned uh, Stuyvesant High School into a morgue 
And then, because the EPA said, ah, don't worry, all they did was mop the floors. These kids went back to school. The air conditioner ducts were filled with this toxic dust. And as, we ta as Ellie talked about it before, kids were getting out of their subways, walking to school while the buildings burned for 99 days. Thousands of others have died as well who are not responders. Um, and we're not only that, but we are seeing aggressive cancers. Somebody mentioned earlier, or I read it in some of the literature, um, that breast cancer is, I think, the second most common or the third most common cancer that they've linked, right? So do you know how rare, and I'll, be, I'll admit my ignorance, I didn't even know that men could get breast cancer. Well, it's so rare that only one in 100,000 men ever get breast cancer. My firm represents 500 women with breast cancer. So you would expect I would represent five men with breast cancer. My firm represents 32 men with breast cancer. Congress finally did the right thing after the EPA screwed up and misled us and misled the 450,000 odd people in the 9-11 community. They passed the Zadroga bill in 2010. They reauthorized it in 2015. But there are two main problems and I'm gonna leave you with this. Two years from tomorrow, the Victim Compensation Fund will expire for good. Yet I don't think people are gonna stop getting cancer. I don't think they're gonna stop dying. Unfortunately, there isn't enough money that was set aside in 2015, and as a result, the special master has already announced that starting in February, future awards are gonna be reduced. They just don't have enough money. Nobody envisioned the rate of cancers and respiratory illnesses or the deaths that would be so much higher than anyone thought possible. Congress must act again and extend the Victim Compensation Fund. Everybody else here has talked about NICER, so I'm not gonna talk about that. That's in my written report, but I just wanna thank you for taking the time and especially for now reaching out to the former school children. I don't know, I mean, it should be known, but the, you know, why should these families, why should these kids who have now moved from all over the country, why should they connect the dots that the cancer they suffered or they were diagnosed with in 2014 was, is now considered related to their toxic exposure during the school year of 2001, 2002? Thank you so much. Thank you so much to all of you for your testimony, and we're going to get kicked out of here this, uh, uh, before I pass it over. I just want to say for, on the record that the mayor's office of pensions uh, were asked to attend, and uh, they, yeah, they, they, they were invited and they did not show. Um, but we're going to continue to uh, apply the pressure and get the answers that are necessary, obviously. Uh, this is something that is near and dear to all of uh, the members that are here today and to the council, and that we look forward to working with each and every one of you to, to advance this. And um, your testimony here today is absolutely not lost on uh, the members of these two committees. Um, we, we ask you here today because uh, as clarification, as we move forward, that we want something to send to the administration. We want to be able to work with our colleagues in the state and federal government to ensure that we provide the critical services that all the victims of 9-11 and, and their survivors deserve. And so, we, we, again, we thank you for, for your testimony here today. Uh, Council Member Levine. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and I second those uh, remarks and uh, wanted to ask if any of you could comment on whether there are health conditions that you're seeing amongst the folks you're working with which are not currently covered by the health programs. I think uh, John will also speak on this, but we're seeing a large number of autoimmune issues, a large number of neur uh, neuropathy and neuropathic issues that are coming in. Uh, some of them are secondary to uh, underlying conditions, but uh, there's a large number of cases that are out there, and that's why you have the Scientific Advisory Committee from the World Trade Center Health Program that's looking into getting new conditions uh, passed. It takes a long time to get them in. There's definitely people out there right now that are waiting that need to be in the program, and I'm sure Michael could speak to, to that as well. To order to, to get a illness, a new illness added to the Sidroga bill, 
you have to petition the scientific technical advisory committee. You got to have medical research. You got to have uh, medical journals. Um, you have to have the science to back it up. Autoimmunes being looked at, neuropathies being looked at. We're seeing a lot of heart cases. Standalone heart by itself is not on the bill, but as a secondary illness, it is. This is a long, grueling process, but this is what we have. We're working every day to make this better. But I want to ask you guys, in the future, when you do hearings, let us be your experts. Let us sit down with you guys so we can educate you guys so when you're asking the questions to those who are disingenuous, we'll let you know when they're lying. We'll let you know when they're not telling you the truth. We'll let you know when they're raising their right hand and they don't tell the truth. We know the 9-11 community. We know the science. We work with the federal, state, and local governments. There's not nothing the three of us don't know. We want to help. Not only do we help the 9-11 community every day, we want to help the people that are helping us. Because that's what we do. And that's what we're good at. So before you ask about fatalities, nobody keeps track of fatalities but me. I keep track of fatalities. From September 1st to September 1st in the calendar year, we lost 163 people. My criteria, were well, you at ground zero? Were well, you in the World Trade Center Health Program? Did you have a VCF claim? And did you die from an illness covered under the bill? Since September 1st, we've lost 38 people. So we now know a little over 2,000 people have died since 9-11 from a 9-11 related illness. No government agency is gonna take the onus of that. They don't wanna own that. They don't wanna admit they did anything wrong. But I keep track of everything. I am the 9-11 rain man. And that's not something that I'm proud of because nobody else would do what I did for the last 15 years. So let us help you. Thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, you have, Council Member Barron. Thank you to the chairs and thank you to the panel for presenting your testimony. It's always, as you've indicated, critical that we hear from those who are on the front lines. And I wasn't here for the administration testimony, but I can certainly believe that it was not fully truthful or forthcoming because as, we, as has been alluded to earlier, EPA misled, misinformed, or even lied when they said that the air was safe to breathe. Uh, they say they didn't have all the information. Then you should have withheld your comments you or your decision until you had all the information. But certainly those who suffered and who have died and who have those illnesses based on their offering their services at that time are certainly entitled to all of the compensation and all the health benefits and all of the uh, procedures that they need to get better. And we want to thank you for coming. We thank you for caring. Thank and that means a lot. You know, sometimes it's just uh, showing empathy and showing sympathy that the 9-11 community needs. They need somebody that's going to show them that they care not a bunch of union leaders or a government or city agencies that are gonna blow smoke up their ass. I've been to 181 funerals. I paid for nine of them. I'm sure Richie's been to dozens of funerals himself. We've seen the pain and suffering in this 9-11 community. That's gonna be a generation long uh, battle for us. So we need all the help we can get. Well, the council will stand with all those who have survived and all those that suffered in their families. And we look forward to continue to engage in each and every person that testified and, and spent time to come in here today. So I want to thank the staffs for putting this together. It was absolutely uh, uh, critical that we do this. They did a great job again, Malcolm, Joe, uh, Brandon, and the staff of, of Council Member Levine. Um, thank you so much. And with that, it, we are right on the button. and. This, Hearing is adjourned.